Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, present some of the findings from our Insight project at UCSF called NBSeq. Uh, we have no conflicts to disclose, and I also want to say what I'm reporting is um, results that a whole wonderful team has put together, and everything they have contributed it contributed is correct, and so if there are any mistakes, they're my own. Um, so NBSeq uh, was formed to address these questions, as you just heard, that were um, posed uh, by NIH. First, could exome sequencing replace the current mass spectrometry uh, that is performed by public health laboratories as a newborn screen for inborn errors of metabolism. And second, maybe it couldn't replace, but could sequencing augment the information that is obtained uh, through current newborn screening programs and actually improve case resolution and public health outcomes? So newborn screening has to work as a public health program. It focuses on conditions which are urgent, they're infant onset and treatable disorders that are not detected except by newborn screening. The demonstrable public health benefit and practical considerations have allowed newborn screening to be performed without explicit parental consent. Medical need rather than technology should be the driver of any population-based screening, including newborn screening. So those are our starting principles. Um, also, uh, just to describe the disorders that we chose to look at, which is the inborn errors of metabolism in California. Um, these are rare genetic defects that cause serious disease in infancy, but that are treated um, and successfully treated with special diets and other um, treatment modalities. The list includes 48 inborn errors of fat metabolism, organic acid metabolism, and amino acid metabolism. And about 150 cases of infants with these disorders are identified each year in California, which has the largest number of births of any state. In fact, it's one eighth of all the babies born in the US are born in California. Um, and newborn screening by this MSMS or mass spectroscopy is, is extremely effective. You can see here that um, uh, the sensitivity is overall about over 99.3%, and the specificity is also well over 99%. Um, the sensitivity is important because newborn screening really should not be missing uh, infants, and, and it's um, really tragic if an infant is missed. And the specificity is very important because there's a lot of anxiety uh, involved if, in telling a family that their infant may have one of these conditions. And there's a lot of medical cost in terms of specialist effort and uh, testing that goes on. So you don't want to have a lot of uh, infants and their families involved in this if they don't actually have a disorder. So what are the resources that we brought to bear? Uh, well, California, I told you already, has a lot of infants born every year, and it's also an extremely diverse population. So that is um, quite interesting. For example, in cystic fibrosis, uh, it was found in California that the typical panels that were good for um, Northern European Caucasians just didn't work in California, where so many people have different um, ancestral backgrounds. We were able to take advantage of California's archived dried blood spots. And these are the uh, blood spot on a piece of filter paper 
that is used for the metabolic screening and other newborn screening tests. And in California, the leftovers from this testing are stored um, in a biobank for potential fu future use. And I'll get into that in detail because it's very important. Follow-up data from the metabolic specialty centers is also uh, tracked in California and put into a central electronic database. So, so we have follow-up data as well as newborn dried blood spots. And we have a multidisciplinary team with expertise in genomic sequencing and analysis in genetics, ethics, and clinical diagnosis and management of these inborn errors. So the California Biobank is an invaluable and irreplaceable resource. The dried blood spot residuals have been stored there since 1982, and the samples can be made available for research to improve the health of women and children. And what's listed here is the website of the California Biobank where the regulations and, and laws establishing um, the bank and its use are, are described in detail. Um, the purpose of this biobank is to foster development of new and improved newborn screening tests and other uh, modalities for the public good. Projects using the biobank materials have to be IRB approved and the samples have to be de-identified to protect the privacy of individuals uh, of the babies who are born. And good data stewardship is absolutely required and monitored with great care to protect the individual's privacy. And at the end of the study, remaining samples and large DNA data files must be destroyed. Any individual may request to have his or her sample removed and destroyed, and such requests are all um, honored with documentation. So we thought a lot about the distinction of different contexts for genetic information. And as everybody is aware, there's been a lot of, uh, uh, there's been a big increase in the amount of genomic sequencing that is being done. Um, and it's being, in some cases, offered directly to the public without a doctor in between. Uh, but clearly, uh, the context has, has been different in different situations. And we mostly think about the diagnostic content, context of an infant who has some abnormal phenotype and we don't know an underlying cause, so we look for uh, genomics and genomic sequencing for an answer. So this is um, an individual patient who is uh, being evaluated by a doctor with an abnormal phenotype that is the start and the driver of the analysis. But public health newborn screening is completely different. In this context, there is limited or no phenotype. Almost all the infants are unaffected. And those who are affected actually appear healthy because they're pre-symptomatic. So the enthusiasm for success in the diagnostic context shouldn't be allowed to carry over willy-nilly into the newborn screening context. They're really quite different. I think many people are already familiar with whole exome sequencing, and, and uh, it was described in the introduction to this session. So in this technology, uh, DNA fragments are captured and sequenced from the coding portions of the roughly 20,000 human genes. And this represents less than 2% of the entire genome and excludes introns and uh, of the intervening DNA sequences. And some of these we know are actually important uh, for regulating genes, but we don't know much about how they're important. So uh, the exome is sort of a, a shortcut. It's uh, not expected to be completely um, uh, effective, but it is 
easy to come by and, and uh, uh, useful. So we, this is the um, technology that we settled on. And the newborn, uh, the NBC group, elected also within this exome to analyze only 78 genes that are known to be involved in inherited metabolic uh, disorders on our list, and we call this an exome slice. So this is actually the largest to date whole exome sequence uh, study of an unbiased uh, cohort of patients with inborn errors of metabolism. And so we think that this study can establish a benchmark for the capabilities of exome sequencing in the newborn screening context. These are just some uh, numbers of uh, samples in our study that I want to go over very briefly. We, we first requested about 1,700 uh, samples, and we included those with a known uh, diagnosed inborn error of metabolism, including nine who had been missed by the newborn screening process but were picked up clinically uh, later in life. We also included uh, nearly 400 false positives. And then when the, uh, after the request was made, we had to eliminate 538 of them for various reasons. Uh, we ran out of money and also some of the samples, um, even though we attempted a sequence, the exome didn't pass our quality control metrics. So we ended up with uh, nearly 1,200 samples to analyze. And uh, of these, 805 did actually have a proven inborn error, and there were 385 false positives by the mass spec test. And we divided the samples into an initial small validation set and, a, and then the rest of them were our test set. And the validation set was used by Dr. Brenner and his colleagues at Berkeley to develop a screening uh, pipeline for analysis. And, and this was um, different from the typical diagnostic um, pipeline. And, and we really don't have time to go into it, unfortunately. But, um, these are results that came out at the end of the day from the um, test set of individuals who were actually affected with a disorder. And um, you can see that the exomes did identify all kinds of uh, known and, and new predicted mutations. You can see there some of them were actually uh, already listed in ClinVar or HGMD databases. Others were um, very rare variants. Some were predicted to be damaging by introducing uh, stop codons and so on. And then at the bottom, you can see, um, so of those 674, we got 571 right. So I would give us maybe a B plus for that because we missed 103. And uh, I want to just give you a few examples of what we did right and what we missed. So here's one we got right, just to show. Uh, this is the PAH uh, gene, which is um, mutated in phenylketonuria. And you can see in this list of variants that our exome found a lot of variants in this particular individual, and that's quite typical. The, the genome contains a lot of variation. But those uh, two top ones shaded in pink are actually known pathogenic variants. And so uh, when our pipeline identified two clearly pathogenic variants, it flagged the sample as positive. And so this sample was correctly uh, diagnosed. Here's one, though, where we didn't do quite so well. And, uh, so this was a case of luteric aciduria type 1. And the gene um, had a lot of variants. And you can see the variants listed there. But uh, uh, they're either very common, in which case we thought, oh, that's ridiculous, can't be. Or we'd have people walking around with uh, 
uh, GA type 1 disease all over the place, which we know we don't have. And so we, we really rejected um, these variants based on um, their frequency, or some of them were actually known to be benign, and we didn't come up with anything that um, could explain this patient's phenotype. But the patient did clearly have this disease, so we missed this one. Here's another one, uh, another instance where our exome um, wasn't adequate and, and uh, missed two cases here of isovaleric acidemia. Um, and we wonder why that was and actually took some of these samples, a subset of our, of our exome cases, and submitted them to whole genome sequencing. And you can see in these two instances there were genomic deletions, and exome sequencing is very insensitive for picking up this kind of defect. Um, you can see those sort of clear areas, those white spots indicate areas of poor coverage, and the first um, individual had a homozygous um, uh, deletion, and, and you can see on the top, I don't know quite how this pointer works. Oh. Uh, so here's a diagram of the gene, and this is the uh, deletion in this individual, and you can see that the, um, this section of the gene, this, the five prime end of it, was deleted. Um, and in the second individual, there are actually two deletions, a, a little one here, so there's no coverage in the exon 12 area, and a larger deletion representing this area, low coverage across the gene. So, so insertions and deletions, um, uh, exomes are not great for. Here's another one we missed. Um, and, and in this one, we actually had, we were good. In, in one case, we got a um, variant that was flagged that is known to be, uh, well, let's see, uh, ClinVar thought it was pathogenic and, and HTMD, at least questionably uh, a disease mutation. And, and this, um, ooh, wait, how do I go back? Okay, so, and this is the, the, um, uh, the disease is MCAD here that we're looking at. And we required our pipeline to find two variants in order to uh, flag an individual because otherwise we'd end up with 30,000 or so um, uh, cases a year, which is just not reasonable. And so uh, we didn't find another variant that we could identify. So this one was not called out, but in, it turned out that the person actually had disease. And when we went back and examined the sequence, uh, we noted that there was a, a variant here um, just upstream from this exon, and um, it was a potential splice uh, mutation because of the lariat formation and the branch point A. But this, the, all of the uh, prediction programs gave the branch point A role to different uh, A residues in this case. And so we had to actually resort to a research lab that made a construct to check whether splicing uh, did or did not happen when this variant was introduced. And sure enough, it turned out this variant is critical for splicing. Splicing, therefore, would not occur in this uh, allele, and that did explain the patient's disease, even though the uh, screening couldn't have picked it up. So just to summarize this, our overall exome sensitivity was 88% across uh, all of the diseases, but, but uh, uh, what's important here is that some of the genes did a lot better than others. So here I'm uh, indicating in green the ones that we got right, and in brown um, the ones that we missed. And you can see that um, even for a common disease like PKU or very common like MCAD, um, we, we were unhappy that these uh, cases that had been picked up by 
tandem mass spectroscopy were being missed by exomes. So this leads us to think that um, sequencing exomes alone would not be a good replacement for um, uh, mass spec newborn screening. So what I can conclude here is that the whole exome sequencing worked as well as the mass spec screening for certain disorders. And actually, in some cases, even better, because some of those false negatives uh, were identified by our exome pipeline. But the uh, exomes may, oh, sorry, the exomes may also work well in some cases where there is no mass spec screen. So we have to think about other genes we would like to screen for and don't have a test right now, and maybe sequencing can be such a test. However, uh, for many conditions, the exome sequencing was less good, and uh, we really do have to consider gene by gene. And this um, is leading to our final conclusion that sequencing could be a helpful second-tier test uh, following a, a positive newborn screen to help reduce false positives in some of the conditions that have a lot of false positives now. So what have we learned? Well, one thing is that genetic tests do not guarantee that one can identify a disease perfectly. And in fact, a, a third of all the variants we found had never been seen before and were not put in any of the databases. And that just reflects, I think, California's diversity um, that our, our collection of, of uh, variants worldwide is lagging, and uh, California is an indicator of that. Uh, the exome analysis was insufficient to identify pathogenic variations in populations with diverse ethnic backgrounds. And also, we found that the notion of a variant being pathogenic is actually an oversimplification uh, for these autosomal recessive disorders because uh, it turned out that sometimes diplotypes really uh, had a big influence on the final phenotype. And, and what I mean by that is that sometimes a particular variant on one allele with a particular one on the other allele turned out worse than you would have expected, uh, for example, worse than somebody who is homozygous for either one alone, or sometimes uh, better than expected. And so it really opens a new can of worms that we have to not only examine things gene by gene and variant by variant, but by combinations of variants with each other. Okay, so um, overall we say at this time, whole exome sequencing alone is unsuitable as a sole newborn screening uh, modality for inborn errors of metabolism. For selected disorders, however, it was just as good as uh, MSMS. And the sequence information from our whole exomes could reduce false positives in the tests already being done and could facilitate an accurate and timely case resolution. So this is our NBSeq team. I'm very proud to be a member of them, and that'll conclude my presentation. Thanks, Jennifer. And just a reminder for those who are listening in, if you have any questions, please send them into the email address that's available on Genome TV. And with that, I will turn it over to Cynthia Powell, who's going to present from the UNC Chapel Hill site. 